All right, we're recording now. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so, does anyone have any questions uh, that they'd like on the record before we uh, before we uh, begin with the lecture? Um, I have a question about representability, but I guess that can oh, go ahead, Arvind. That's that's great. Um, it, it's sort of um, if you have a sheaf that's representable after a base change, mm -hmm. or let's even say an, an etal base change, mm -hmm. um, then does that mean it's representable already? Um, let me think about that for a second. Uh, so, so the answer is no in general. Um, and the reason is that uh, descent for schemes is not in general effective. Okay, um, so it so, is a so, question of um, the same thing. Yeah, yeah exactly right. So, so the, um, the issue, uh, what, what will be the case is that it will be representable by an algebraic space. Um, that, but yeah, that's, that's what happens. So we'll discuss some representability issues actually in a, in a little bit. So that, that might also answer some of your questions along those lines. Cool. Uh, any, any other questions before we begin? All right, if not, let's get started. So, so first of all, I wanted to make a remark. So I think Ben Church pointed this out to me in, um, in office hours. So what I've been calling a torsor, so let me remind you. So what I've been calling a torsor And calling a torsor. So that was a sheaf with some, some action. Um, calling a torsor. So that was, a, remember, that was a sheaf with some action by a, a sheaf of groups such that some condition is satisfied, which I told you was the analog of, of acting simply transitively on fibers. So, so some sources call this a, a pseudo torsor. So in particular, the stacks project calls this a pseudo torsor. Okay, and then what I've been calling a, a locally trivial torsor. So some sources call a, uh, a torsor. So, so this might be a bit confusing. So I'm using this notation because I think people often kind of elide the, the representability issues and, and so on underlying underlying like where, where, when is a torsor representable? Like in Arvind's question, where exactly is it locally trivial? Um, and this sort of thing. And so I'm, I'm trying to always say that when I, when I discuss torsors. Um, but if, if you're ever confused about that, um, please, please ask. And, and I figured I should mention this um, in case you decide to look at other sources. So in particular, the Stacks project has some very good information on this stuff and, and you should take a look, but just be aware uh, that it's using slightly different notation. All right, so, so uh, with that, I wanna, I wanna return to where we were at the end of last time. So let me just remind you, we were proving a theorem, which I called Hilbert's Theorem 90. And I'll, I'll explain why I'm calling it that because you, you probably or may or may not have seen a, a something called Hilbert 90 in the past and it might not look exactly like this version of Hilbert 90. But I, I wanna start by recalling the statement and, um, and, and, and spending a little bit more time on the proof because we kind of zoomed through it at the end of last time. So, th so the statement was, um, well, you can look at locally trivial torsors for the group GLN on the Zariski side of a scheme X. There's a map from this, or map to this rather, from locally trivial torsors for GLN on the Atal side of X. And there's a map to this from uh, uh, locally trivial torsors on, sorry, on the FPPF, on the small FPPF side of X for GLN. Okay, and the theorem is that all of these maps are isomorphisms. Okay, so let, let's just remind ourselves um, what the proof was. So, so, so can anyone help me talk through it? So we did discuss it a little bit at the end of last time, but I, I want to discuss it again now. So, so the observation was that, so let's let tau be one of these sites. So let's let tau be either x Zariski, x Atal, or x FPPF. And we observed that the data the data of a GLN torsor a GLN torsor 
split by some cover, some tau cover, maybe I'll say, u to x is the same as descent data uh, for a vector bundle. relative to u over x. So can anyone remind me why this is true? Any thoughts? Vector bundles because... have an associated frame bundle. Yeah, so one way of saying it was that to go from a uh, a uh, vector bundle to a, a GLN torsor. There's an equivalence between vector bundles and GLN torsors by given by sending a vector bundle to its associated frame bundle. But can anyone just tell me explicitly how to actually get out descent data? Can anyone remind me of this? Well, I guess if you have a local trivialization, then on the overlaps, you get an explicit element of GLN. That's the isomorphism of the OM. Yeah, exactly right. So, so let's let's draw the diagram. So we have U cross U over X goes to U in two different ways. So this is, let me draw it this way. So this is what I'll call pi one and pi two. And then we have X here, let's call this pi. So, so we have, what does it mean that U trivializes our torsor? It means that pi star of our torsor T is isomorphic to pi star of G as a G torsor. We're here just G acts on, as well as a pi star G torsor, I guess. Um, so G acts on itself by, by left multiplication. So, so what that means is that, well, now we're, we're pulling back, we can pull back in two different ways. So we can pull back pi one star of pi star t. And because this is something pulled back from x, this is the same as pi two star of pi star t. Well, now this is the same as pi one star of pi star g, just because uh, pi star t was the same as pi star g. And this is the same as pi two star of pi star g for the same reason. Okay, and then the claim is that, well, well, this arrow here is precisely descent data for t. And the claim here is that this arrow, so what is this arrow? This is, well, it's an isomorphism from g to itself, right? Both of these things are isomorphic to g restricted to u cross u. Okay, and the claim is that an, isomorph an automorphism of such a thing as a G-torsor is a section to G. Okay, so what do you have if you have a section to GLN, so an invertible matrix, on double intersections in a cover? That's precisely de descent data for a vector bundle. Does that, anyone disagree with that or have questions about it? So, so if you have, in other words, if you have on double intersections, if you have a section to GL of GLN, which satisfies the COSA condition, that's descent data for a vector bundle. Hey Daniel, just sorry, a non-math request. Could you possibly uh, um, switch to a thinner uh, brush size? Because I, I think it's a little uh, difficult to uh, sure. uh, tell between the... How's this? Is that better? Uh, yeah, thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you for, for requesting that. Okay. Um, so, so we have a section to G. So, so we claim, we, we've claimed that uh, for any of these sites, uh, a locally trivial uh, GLN torsor is the same as a vector bundle, or same as descent data for a vector bundle. And now remember, so, so FPPF descent, which we proved a few weeks ago, tells us that descent data for vector bundles, for vector bundles, is effective.
So, so what that tells us is that if we have a, in particular, if we have a, a GLN tracer in the FPPF site, which is a GLN tracer which is locally trivial in the FPPF site, then it's also locally trivial in the Zariski site and hence in the Atel site, right? So, so this tells us how to go back and forth. We're, we, we've now finished the proof. So, so we have a map here. So, so what have we done? We've shown, we've shown, in other words, that all for all of these sites, so in other words, H1 of X tau for any of these uh, sites, GLN is, is, is in bijection with the category of n-dimensional in bijection, sorry, with the set of isomorphism classes of n-dimensional vector bundles on X. All right. Are there any questions about that? So, so that's that's the end of the proof. So if you have three things and they're all isomorphic to the same thing, they're all isomorphic. Any any questions about that? Okay, so so here's a fun. Sorry, sorry, my my screen keeps shifting like this. It's doing it automatically for some reason. So here's an exercise. So can you find some other groups? Find other groups like other than GLN for which Hilbert ninety is true. Is true, or for which it's not true. And we'll discuss a sort of very famous example of a, of a group where it's not true later on in the, um, in the day, uh, but, but it's sort of fun. So there are other examples besides GLN where, where a sort of analogous statement is true, where FPPF G torsors are the same as, um, as for example, Zariski G torsors. In, in general, that's, that's not the case. All right. So, so let me just make a, a few remarks about representability and, and local triviality. So first of all, um, so 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 what did what did we use here? So we used that descent is effective for vector bundles. Um, so so first of all, uh, so suppose G is an affine uh, flat uh, x scheme or x group scheme. Sorry. So so here's a question you can ask. So, so uh, what, so are, are all G torsors representable by a G scheme? Okay, and it turns out the answer is yes, in this case. So, so using, using affineness. Okay, and we more or less gave the proof last time. So, so last time I explained how to do this for, for uh, affine et al group schemes and the same proof works. Do you mean by an X scheme? Or? But yeah, by an X scheme, sorry about that. Right, so this is by the same proof as last time. So you should try working out the details. So the point is that you can trivialize such a, a G torsor by, by um, yeah, you, you can trivialize such a, a, a thing flat locally and, uh, and, then, and then use FPPF descent. Okay, and then the, the second question you can ask is, is suppose, so, so given a, a G torsor T, and let's, let's suppose it's FPPF locally trivial, You can ask, is it at all locally trivial? Okay, and the answer in general is no. But it's yes if yes if G is smooth. So can anyone give me an example of a, a non-smooth um, group scheme? Any thoughts? Maybe the kernel of Fabianius or something. 
Yeah, so if, for example, if you take the kernel of Frobenius on the affine line, RGA, so that's called alpha P, and that's not a smooth group scheme. Another example is mu P in characteristic P, so the, the thing that represents P roots of unity. Uh, so that's the, if you'd like, the kernel of Frobenius on GM. Yeah, and in general, in, in fact, if you take any uh, positive dimensional affine group scheme, the, the kernel of Frobenius will not be smooth. So that's, that's a great example. Okay, and you could also take, for example, take mu p times GLN, and that's that's another example. So, so, so in general, um, you need smoothness, and and the reason why uh, is that you can just take an FPPF local trivialization. Um, you can, in fact, you can trivialize by by t itself, and then slice it to get an HL trivialization. So this is a, a fun little exercise to try, and it's not trivial, um, but I, I won't discuss it un unless we need it later, and I think we'll be able to avoid it. Sorry, what do you mean by slice it? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So, so, so let's let's see, let I mean, me say a word about the proof. Name. So, proof sketch. So let's we have t to x. This is this is our our torsor, and we can base change it to itself. Okay, and and just a reminder. So this this torsor over t is trivial, and there are a few ways to see it. One one is that it has a section given by the diagonal map, right? Um, but but uh, another is that, well, what was the definition of a torsor? It was that t times t is isomorphic to t times g via the action map. And, and it turns out that's, that's the same as, as this triviality statement, right? And, and now the claim is that, okay, well, well, this map, this trivializing map, t to x here, we can, we can this is a, a smooth map because G itself was smooth and, and the fibers of T are isomorphic to the fibers of G, right? So, so this is smooth. And, and the claim is that we can find some U in here closed so that this composition is a tall, is an atoll cover. So, so what I mean by slice is, is slice it to find such a U. And you can do this, for example, using the, the structure theorem for th smooth morphisms. Does, does that answer your question, Arvind, or do you want me to say more? Um, you mean like, um, okay, I guess I just have to think about why such a U should um, exist, okay. Yeah, 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 so it's not so obvious, but so imagine, for example, that T was just affine space over X, so that would be like spec of OX, the relative spec of OX to join like X1, X2, X3 or something. So how would you find such a U there? You would just set X1 and X2 to zero, so that's slicing, right? Or sorry, X1, X2, and X3 to zero for example. So that, that's what I mean by slicing. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and, and in fact, the proof is just do that a, a tell locally, basically, uh, which, is, which is something you can do using the structure theorem. Okay, but, but uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to mention that for culture. Okay, so, so let's, um, let's talk about this theorem here. So let me maybe copy and paste it. Um, I'm sorry. So let's talk about what this means. So let's do some examples. So the easiest example is where X is spec K. Let's suppose G, let's suppose N is one. So we're, we're looking at the atoll cohomology of a field with coefficients in GM, right? So, so in this case, can anyone tell me what is H1 of spec K Zariski with coefficients in GM? So I'm asking about line bundles on spec of a field. Should be easy. Yeah, yeah, it's zero, right? It's because we're line bundles on a point are all trivial. Okay, and what, what this is saying is that this is the same as H1 of spec K at all with coefficients in GM, for example. And this is the same if you know about Galois cohomology as H1 of the Galois group with coefficients in K bar cross by, by the isomorphism between atel homology of fields and Galois homology we discussed a couple class periods ago. 
Okay, and this equality between Galois cohomology of, of k bar cross and zero is what's usually called Hilbert 90. So, so this is some kind of massive generalization to any, any scheme. Uh, so, so hopefully that explains the etymology a little bit. And by the way, there was a question last time about why it's called Hilbert 90, and, and the reason is indeed that, that Hilbert, Hilbert numbered his theorems in at least one of, one of his books. Um, cool. All right, so let's, um, let's generalize this observation. Um, so example, so suppose now X is any scheme and N is one. So, so what if we computed, we've now computed H1 of X et al with coefficients in GM, uh, the, namely the, the sheaf which associates to an open of, of X et al and I tell morphism to you the, the set of invertible functions on you. So, so can anyone tell me what is this H1 that we've computed? Pick. It, I'm sorry? Um, just pick. pick yeah, it's pick of X. That's exactly right. So this is something we know, we know well. Great. So now, now we can start computing things. So this is, this is sort of the, the big accomplishment. Um, that, that we've managed in the last class period. We, we now know each one of one interesting sheaf and, and we're gonna leverage that as, as hard as we can. Okay, so, so let's, let's, uh, let's use this, sorry. So let's compute H1 of X et al with coefficients in the sheaf mu L where here L is a prime or L is a, a number which is invertible on X. So, so when I say that, I mean, I mean, uh, for example, or for a field of characteristic prime to L or, or if you'd like, I mean, we don't need that. We just need L, L is a function on X and I want that function to be invertible. Um, all right, so, so can anyone tell me how, to, how do I compute this? So I wanna use what we've done in the previous example, namely that we've compute, computed the total homology of GM. So <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, there's an exact sequence mu L to GM to GM by multiplication by. by yeah, exactly right. So we're going to use the following atoll, exact sequence of atoll sheaves. So zero, well, I guess it should be one to mu L to GM to GM to one. And this was the map Z goes to Z to the L. Um, Okay, and, and this sequence has a name. It's called the Coomer sequence. And, and we, we talked a few class periods ago about why, why sorry, I'm gonna switch back to vertical because this is, this is ridiculous how my screen keeps moving. Um, all right, so maybe that's better. So, so we, we talked a, a few class periods ago about why this is a, an exact sequence of, of sheaves in the atal topology. So can anyone, but can any, anyone remind me why? Because after an atal base change, everything is, is an lth power. That's exactly right. So, so you can just adjoin an lth power of any given function. And that's, that's an atal, that gives you an atal cover. Okay, so what does this give us? So this gives us a long exact sequence in cohomology, right? If we have a short exact sequence of sheaves, we get a long exact sequence in cohomology. And what does that cohomology look like? What does that sequence look like? So we get zero, H zero of X et al with mu L coefficients. That goes to H zero of X et al with GM coefficients. That's something we know, that's just invertible functions on X. GM coefficients. So this is just multiplicate that taking things to the lth power. So then we get um, H1 of X et al with mu L coefficients. So this is what we're trying to compute. Um, and that maps to now something we understand. It maps to pick X. So we've just identified H1 of X et al with GM coefficients as pick, pick X. Now we get multiplication by L here, and we get pick X, and then we get some H2s, and so far we don't know anything about those H2s. And then so 
Great. So, so this is this is what we can say about um, about um, about each one of actually told new L coefficients. So, so for example, let's suppose that um, let's suppose uh, now let's make some assumptions on X. So suppose X is um, proper, and uh, well, let's let's just suppose. Uh, H zero of X O X is just the ground field K and suppose that's algebraically closed. So then, then we can, then we can figure out, first of all, that H zero X et al mu L is what? Anyone? It's going to be um, zero, right? Uh, will it be zero? Um. So it'll be the L roots of unity, right? So it's the kernel of this L power map from H zero of G. Yeah, yeah. Zero of G. Sorry, yeah. So it's just it's just mu L of K. Great. And what about H one with mu L coefficients? Well. So now this map is surjective, right? Because every, this is just, so, so what is, what are these groups? So this is K cross in this situation, this is K cross and we're over an algebraically closed field. So every element of K has an alpha root. So this map is surjective, right? So that tells us that the thing we're interested in, this group is just the kernel of this map. So in other words, it's pick X and then the L torsion. Great. Wait, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. So we can interpret the pick X here as GM torsors, right? That's right. Yeah. And um, so, how do how do we understand the the group operation on on the in terms uh, uh, of uh, from the, uh, at the level of GM torsors? You mean? Yeah. Yeah. So at the level of line bundles, it's just tensor product, right? Right. If you want to think about it in terms of GM torsors, probably the easiest thing to say is you would write down the check cycle describing the GM torsor. So that's some some invertible functions on on double intersections of some cover, right? On u cross u, where u is some cover, and then you can just multiply those functions together. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, great. Um, cool. So so this I mean you can also make a, a geometric description directly in terms of um, in terms of of torsors if you'd like, but maybe maybe let's let's save that for office hours if 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 you're interested. Okay, so so this is this is we've now computed this. Um, so so I'll come back to this in a second, um, and and we'll make this totally explicit for curves. But I, I wanna I wanna talk a little bit more about some other examples. So let's try the following. So let's try um, H one et al. Uh, with sorry H one of X et al. With coefficients in the constant sheep z mod l z. And, and again, let's assume x is over a field k, which is algebraically closed. So can anyone tell me what, what this is? Um, and here I want L invertible, L invertible in k. So we already did this if, if L is, um, is, is the characteristic of k. So can anyone tell me what this is? So what does the sheaf Z mod LZ look like in this situation? So, so my claim is that the sheaf Z mod LZ is just isomorphic to mu L if you're over a, in fact, if you're over a field which contains all the L roots of unity. So, so why is that? So you can just define the isomorphism. Yeah. So how do you, how would you do that? Um, pick a generator and send send one to the generator. Great. So you have to pick an pick an L root of unity, a primitive L root of unity, and then you send one to that one to that uh, that primitive L root of unity. 
So, so here, this, this isomorphism depends on a choice of primitive L3 of unity. Okay, and let's just be totally explicit. So, so what is this? This is represented by maps into spec K join T modulo like T times T minus one all the way up to, to T minus L, right? Sorry, T minus L minus L plus one. For example, and then you have to write down a funny operation on that. Um, and this one is represented by spec of k join t mod t to the n t to the l minus one, right? So, so both of these things are just are, are just schemes of dimension zero. They're different unions of points, using that l is is invertible in the base. I'm just using like the the Chinese remainder theorem. So one can just by hand write down an isomorphism between those two schemes, just sending points to different points. And, uh, and uh, hence, between the functors they represent. OK, so what that tells us is that in this situation, so the corollary is that if um, UL is contained in K, so K has all roots of unity, HI, H1, or HI, in fact, of X et al with Z mod LZ coefficients is isomorphic to HI of X et al with mu L coefficients. Okay, and again, this isomorphism depends on a primitive, a choice of primitive L through of unity. So in particular, once we talk about Galois actions on Intel cohomology, this will, will not be Galois invariant, not, not, will not be Galois equ equivariant. You can already see that for H0. I mean, Galois acts trivially on Z mod LZ, but, but not on L through of unity. All right, cool. Are there are there any questions about that? I guess there's a question on the chat window. Oh, let me take a look. Uh, ben Church says, if I have a non-integral scheme over X, can't I get more elements in mu L? So remember, L is invertible in the in the ground field. So 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 the answer is no. If 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 you had if L was not invertible, then you could. But maybe could you say a bit more, Ben? Oh, you're, you're, you're with me? Yeah, so, so in particular, I mean, this is the proof. You just write down an isomorphism between the two representing objects. I'm All sorry, right. thinking about that for a moment, the Z mod LZ, I mean, if you, if you take an open affine, then um, the sections is, are just um, choosing an element for each connected component. That's right. And then um, mu L, so that means that the, the, the coordinate ring on that open affine will will have that many factors in, in the product decomposition. Right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So both of them will just be mu L to the number of connected components or Z mod L to the number of connected components. Yeah, great, cool. Okay, so, so finally, I, I do wanna discuss kind of a geometric interpretation of these things. So, so we've now computed, so, so let's suppose X is an affine scheme now. Um, yeah, let's suppose X is an affine scheme. Just, uh, just for concreteness, we've now computed H1 of X et al FP, where here, uh, here, let's suppose I'm over a field K, where, uh, where here P is the characteristic of K. And so let me remind you, this was the co-kernel of um, OX to OX via the map X to the P minus X, right? So this was this Arden Shire business. And we've also computed um, H1 of X et al uh, Z mod LZ, at least in terms of this long Z sequence. And this is if K is K bar. Great. So, so these these um, these groups have meanings, right? These are these are uh, on the top we have FP torsors, and the bottom we have Z mod LZ torsors. 
right? Um, so, so in other words, that, that means something geometrically. That's, um, those are our covering spaces with Galois group FP or Z mod LZ, right? So, so can anyone tell me, like, how would you explicitly write down those covering spaces? So, so let's say, so, so, so here's the question. How does one explicitly write down these torsors? So, so for example, suppose I'm given y, which I'll write in, in square brackets to indicate that I'm thinking of it as like the torsor associated to some geometric object. So suppose I'm given something in H1 x a tall FP, which I, I told you is the co-kernel of some map from OX to OX. So how do you actually write down this covering space? Any thoughts? Is is LP in this example? Um, yeah, this is, sorry, maybe it's not so clear what I wrote here. It's, it's supposed to be a P. And here, here again, P is the characteristic. Oh no. Any thoughts? So let's represent an element in this H1 via just an element of O, right? We said this H1 is, is some quotient of, of the functions on X. Yeah, so Arvind says Arden Schreier. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so here Y is cut out by, uh, let's say Y to the P minus Y equals A, where here A is some element of OX, which we're viewing as, as, as as, as giving us an element in H1FP. So this is, this is called an Arden Schreier covering. Okay, what about, let's try the, the situation with L. So suppose L is not equal to the characteristic of K. And suppose I'm given Z, which is in H1 of X tall, let's say mu L. Um, and let me assume for simplicity that pick X is trivial. So, so in that case, I can write this as, as OX as the co-kernel of OX cross to OX cross, where this map is uh, X goes to X to the L. So, so can anyone help me write down Z? What is this mu L torsor I get? This going to be z to the l is equal to. Yeah, exactly right. So it's it's z to the l equals f, where here f is the element in OX cross, represent and an element in OX cross. Sorry, representing our our um, class in, in cohomology. Okay, and, and how does mu l act on it? It just acts by multiplication on z. Okay, so so I do want to remark. Um, I mean, this story of kind of explicitly writing down covers has a name. So this is, this is called, well, this is the very beginning, I guess, of what I would call explicit class field theory. Explicit geometric class field theory. Which, which gives you a recipe for writing down abelian covers of curves. And I mean, I've only discussed this very special situation where the Picard group is zero. In general, the Picard group intervenes in a, in a kind of crucial way. And, and uh, we can talk about that some other time if you'd like, but, but I, th that's all I wanna say for now. All right, um, are there any questions about that before we start computing the cohomology of curves? Or about anything else?
All right, if not, uh, let's take a, a one minute break. I'm gonna get myself a glass of water. And then uh, when I come back, we'll start computing the cohomology of curves. All right, everyone, I'm back. Um, any any questions have arose while I was getting water? All right, if not, let's start with computing the cohomology of curves. So this is like my favorite topic in this whole course. Um, and, and we've already kind of started doing the computations. So let me kind of tell you what the what the goal is and then um, and then what we've proved so far and what we've left to prove. So the goal is the following theorem. So suppose uh, x is a uh, smooth curve over a field k, which is algebraically closed. Then the following theorem is true. Uh, so then hi of H, X at all with cohomology in GM. So this is somehow the, the sheaf that we can actually compute with and everything else will, will come from that uh, is the following. So, so we already know what uh, H zero is. It's just global sections of GM, which is invertible functions on X. We've just finished computing H one. Can anyone remind me what it was? X. Yeah, it's pick X. Okay, and then the hard part, so, so the, the, we've done one and two. So the hard part is that it's zero if I is bigger than one. So we've done this, we've done this, and then this part is hard. All right. And, and the corollary um, is, is probably what you would, would really think of when you, when you think about the, the uh, cohomology of curves. So it's the following, so X is a smooth proper curve now and, uh, and connected uh, over an algebraic closed field. And uh, L is a prime not equal to the characteristic of K. Then we can compute the cohomology of X sorry, with coefficients in the constant sheaf Z mod L to the NZ. So this is what I, I told you it was meant by atoll cohomology later in the course. And uh, what do we get? Well, we know the answer is if I is zero, we just get the global sections, which are Z mod L to the NZ, if I equals zero. So we, we've more or less computed the, the answer if I is one. So, so what we said it, it was that it was pick of X. Well, we did the case where N is one, but in general, we just get L to the N torsion here. And this we can write explicitly as z mod l to the nz to the 2g. This is i is 1. Then, um, then we'll get z mod lz 
for i is two, and unfortunately I didn't make my brace long enough here, and we get zero if i is bigger than two. Okay, so, so this is the corollary. Um, so, so can anyone explain to me how to deduce the corollary? Assuming the theorem. What is written next to proper? Uh, sorry, connected. Oh, thank you. So can anyone tell me how to prove the theorem? And, and we're going to have to use a black box here, unfortunately. So if, if you haven't seen a little bit about the theory of abelian varieties, then, then I'm sorry, I'll, I'll be explicit about what the black box is, but we're not going to prove it. So, so can anyone tell me what, uh, what pick of a curve looks like? Yes, Jacobian. Yeah, so, so it starts with the Jacobian. So the Jacobian is the connected component of, of the identity in pick. So this is pick zero of X. So that maps to pick of X. And what's the, what's the co-kernel? A neuron safari group. Yeah, so in the case of a curve, that's Z, right? So this is just the degree map. So this is something, if, if it's not familiar to you, you should uh, look at Hartshorn chapter four or, or somewhere else, which, which discusses the cohomology of curves. Okay, and then the black box, which I mean, this isn't a course on, on abelian varieties, um, which I'm gonna use is that this Jacobian of X is a G-dimensional abelian variety. And in particular, it's L to the N torsion is as an abstract group isomorphic to Z mod L to the N Z to the 2G. So if you're familiar with, with the elliptic curves, elliptic curves are one dimensional abelian varieties and their L to the N torsion looks like Z mod L to the N Z squared. And this is a, a higher dimensional generalization of that. Okay, so, so can anyone tell me how to, how to use this to, to prove the corollary? Does that statement require algebraically closed? Um, yes, but I, here we're assuming algebraically closed in both of, both of these theorems. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I mean, yeah. This is this is a geometric statement. I mean, in general, the Jacobian could just have one point, namely the identity, one rational point, rather. Yeah. Okay. So so let, let's do it. So so the Coomer sequence. So that was this short exact sequence of sheaves which went uh, one to mu L to the N to GM to GM to one gives a long Zeph sequence. And let me show you the relevant part. Um, so it gives us, uh, sorry, zero to H1 X et al. Uh, well, we can say Z mod LZ because uh, this is Z mod L to the NZ, sorry because of, we're over an algebraically closed field, this is isomorphic to the constant sheep z mod L to the NZ to uh, H1 X et al, sorry, to, to H1 of GM, which we said was pick. This goes to pick. This is multiplication by L. This goes to uh, H2 X et al, uh, Z mod L to the NZ. Okay, and then the rest of the sequence is zero by the theorem here. So by by this fact that all that the the etal homology of GM vanishes in degree bigger than one. Okay, so what we're doing is we're computing the kernel and co-kernel of this um, this map on pick. Uh, so we need one more fact, which is that the the k bar points of X is is a divisible group. Okay, so, so what do we get? Here we get that this is pick X L to the N torsion. And well, pick X is an extension of Z by a, an abelian variety and Z has no torsion. So this is the same as the Jacobian of X L to the N torsion. And this I told you from our black box was Z mod L to the N Z to the 2G. 
Um, maybe I should have said this is a curve of genus G. All right, so that proves I is one. And now to get I is two, we need to compute this H2, right? So what do we get here? So this is the co-kernel of uh, pick X to pick X, where this is multiplication by L to the N. And what is this? Well, because the Jacobian is divisible, this is the co-kernel just of Z to Z, where the, your multiplication by L to the N. And that is as desired, Z mod L to the N Z. Okay, and then the vanishing in higher cohomology just follows again from this vanishing in, of, of the higher cohomology of GM. So that module of this black box, namely the structure of abelian varieties, is, is a proof of the corollary assuming this goal theorem. Are there other questions about that? Again, just scroll down for a, for a moment. So all I did is, is I wrote down this four term exact sequence, which just came from the Coomer sequence. I said that this H1 is the kernel of multiplication by, it should be L to the N on pick. And H2 is the co-kernel. And then, then the structure of abelian varieties, namely these two black box facts, that the torsion is Z mod L to the N, Z to the 2G, and the, and the identity component is divisible, let us compute the co-kernel and kernel. Uh, I'm confused. If pick X is divisible, then wouldn't the co-kernel- pick zero of X is divisible. Right, this Z part is not divisible. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, so the Jacobian is divisible is the point. So yeah, so what is that saying? It's saying that, well, what you should do if you really want to write this out is write out the snake lemma for multiplication by L on this short exact sequence. So what this is saying is that the co-kernel of multiplication by L on the Jacobian is zero, which means that the co-kernel on pick is the same as the co-kernel on Z. So the, the um, so they, maybe I'll write this as an exercise. So check this using the snake lemma. Well, using the black box and the snake lemma. So what I'm suggesting is applying the snake lemma to what you get by, by applying multiplication by L to this, this short exact sequence. And Freddie said, so that should be L to the N in the Yes, yeah, sorry, this should be an L to the N, not, a, not an L. Sorry about that. Great. Okay, and, and again, I just want to remark, um, so these isomorphisms, so these isomorphisms, once we discuss Gala actions, are not going to be Gala equivariant. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I can say what I mean by the Galois action briefly. So X is a scheme over K bar. If it, if it started over some, some subfield, then the Galois group of that subfield acts on this scheme. And these are functors. So, so the Galois group acts on, acts on the, the, the functors themselves. So in general, what I'm saying is we have these isomorphisms. H1 is canonically, well, after choosing a root of unity. So for example, if K contains the roots of unity, H1 is canonically this, it's more canonically this if we put a mu L, mu L instead of a Z mod, mu, mu L to the N rather than Z mod L to the N, Z. But this isomorphism won't be canonical. And moreover, here this, in, in fact, what will happen, and, and we could prove this now, but I, I won't do it now, I'll do it later. Uh, this, this Z mod L to the N, Z is really the action, the Galois action will be via the cyclotomic character. All right. Um, are there any questions before I, uh, so, so maybe, maybe the remark is, yeah, so, so I said these isomorphisms are not Galois covariant. So are there any, any questions before I move on to discussing what goes into the proof? Okay, so, so let me just remind you what we're trying to do now is we're trying to prove this goal theorem, which computes the atal homology of GM on a smooth curve over an algebraically closed field. So we've already computed H0 and H1, and now what we want to show is that uh, HI of XA tall GM is zero for I bigger than one. So let me actually rewrite that as our goal, and then I'll discuss the ingredients. So the goal now is to show that HI of XA tall GM equals zero for I bigger than one. 
and here x is a smooth curve over an algebraically closed field. Okay, and this will have three, the proof will have three ingredients. And uh, from, from least formal, to, from most formal to least formal, they are, first of all, we'll need to understand the Lorray spectral sequence. which will also be useful throughout the course. So this is a good opportunity to introduce it. So two, we'll need to understand the so-called divisor exact sequence, which I think will be familiar from, from uh, the, the complex analytic world. Um, and three, we'll need to understand Brouwer groups. Um, so, so these are, are, it's really one of my favorite topics and I, I can't wait. Um, so, so I want to start with, um, with the, uh, the Leray special sequence, but, but before I do that, are there any questions? I mean, I'm, I'm not giving you the plan of the proof yet. I'm, I'm just kind of giving you the ingredients. And so we'll develop these ingredients, which are, are interesting in their own right. And then we'll come back to the statement. So, so hopefully, I, I think probably we won't have time to talk about more than the Leray special sequence today, but. But uh, we'll see. So, so are there any questions about about this before I, I dive into these ingredients that we're going to need for this this computation? All right. So um, let's let's start. So we're now starting a new subsection, I guess, which I'll call push forwards and the Lorray spectral sequence. So, so let me just remind you, first of all, what a push forward is. So suppose I have uh, f x to y, a morphism of schemes. Then, then we get a map, a functor, f lower star, from sheaves on x et al to sheaves on y et al. Can anyone remind me how this function is defined? So, so what do I need to do? So, so here given F in sheaves on X et al, F lower star of this capital F applied to some atal morphism u to y is what? F applied to the pullback. Yeah, so it's F applied to u cross x over y. Great. So that was the definition. So this is now a functor. Um, it's uh, so so. The reminder is that this is a this is a left exact functor. Which means it has right derived functors. So we get R i f lower star uh, now, which are functors from uh, sheaves of abelian groups on X et al to sheaves of abelian groups on the y at all. Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's, let's study these, um, let's study these functors. Um, so, so, so here, you're, what you're supposed to think is, so, so uh, let me draw the rubby person thinking. So approximately, you're supposed to think these things are taking cohomology of the fibers. Okay, and the, the warning is that this is not quite true. So, so what they are is they're, ah, uh, yeah, sorry, I missed Freddie had also answered the question of the definition of, of uh, push forward. So, so um, 
the the obstruction to this being true, so the obstruction to these things computing the cohomology of the fibers is called the base change property. Um, and we'll see later in the course that sometimes that's true. So sometimes the formation of these functions computes with the base with base change, which means that they literally compute the cohomology of the fibers. What's true in general, and, and I'll discuss this later, is that um, if you have a you can define a pre-sheaf as follows. So 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 what they really are, so so what Ri f lower star of f does is it's the sheafification, sheafification of the pre-sheaf that sends v to hi of f inverse of v uh, with coefficients in f. Okay. And, and in general, this is not quite computing the cohomology of the fibers because this sheafification operation is, is a little brutal. All right, are there any, any questions about this? So, so far we have computed literally zero examples except for the case where Y is a point. So, so let's talk about it a little bit. So proposition, um, I claim that if F is a finite morphism, Then, um, so, so for example, a closed immersion, then Ri f lower star is just the zero functor for i bigger than zero. So can anyone tell me why this is true? So what do you have to check to check that the derived functors of a, of a left, left exact functor are, uh, are um, what's it called, a uh, uh, zero? Right, exactly. Yeah, so you have to, to, the claim you have to check is that F star is right exact. And I mean, that's the same as being exact because, um, because we know that it's left exact. Um, and, and okay, so can anyone tell me how, how would you approach this claim? So how do you check exactness of a short exact sequence of sheaves? If you do it on the stocks. Yeah, yeah, so the, the, the idea is to check on stocks. Okay, and I'll, I'll leave this as an exercise to you. So the point, um, and this is not totally trivial, but it's not, not too hard, is to, to, to explicitly compute the stocks of this push forward along a finite morphism. And what you'll find is that the stocks are just the, so, so let me just, right, so that here are the stocks of F lower star of F, or maybe I'll write the stock of F lower star of F at a point X bar in uh, y, maybe we'll call it y bar, and y is just the direct sum um, over x bar in f inverse of y bar of the stocks of f at the x bars. And this is for, for f of finite morphism. So we don't need f to be unnamified here? No, that's correct. Um, so you should you should check this. This is this is not a totally trivial exercise, but it's not too hard. Um, and and so this is a maybe let me write this as a, a must do exercise. So so maybe maybe someone who's registered for the course can volunteer to present uh, the solution to this exercise in a future class. Okay, cool. So we've now computed uh, we've computed the drive push forward. So well, subject to this exercise for finite morphisms. So let's, let's try to understand how to, how to, how to, how to um, analyze them in general. So first of all, I need the following technical proposition. So F star, for right now any morphism F, preserves injectives.
and and following my rule of doing a limited amount of, of category theory, I'll just tell you what the, the key category theory that goes into this is. So this is true for any functor uh, with an exact left adjoint. And in this case, we have the left adjoint f upper star, uh, which is which we've we've said as an ex as a adjoint. Does anyone remember why it's exact? Because uh, filtered colimits are exact and sheathification is exact. Yeah, exactly right. Or another way of saying it is, you could check on stocks, and and the the stocks of the inverse image are just the are just the stocks of the original functor. Um, but yeah, that that argument works too. Okay, and then the the formal statement here that that uh, a functor with an exact left adjoint sends injectives to injectives is also going to be an exercise. Okay, um, so let's uh, let's let's let me state the corollary. So this is the uh, the Lorray special sequence. Um, so suppose I now have f from x to y, a morphism of schemes, and g from y to z, another morphism of schemes. So then I claim that there's a spectral sequence which goes from uh, ri g lower star composed with rj f lower star of some sheaf f, and the infinity page converges to ri plus j uh, G composed with F, lower, lower star of F. Okay. So, so, um, so there's a special case, which is kind of the, the most important one, where uh, Z is spec K, where K is an algebraic closed field. Um, and in this case, what do we get? Well, in this case, Ri G lower star is just global sections and same with g of f lower star, or sorry, g lower star and g of f lower star are just taking global sections. So, so we get a, a special sequence h i of uh, y with, sorry, I don't think that's quite right, h i of, um, yeah, sorry, that's right, with coefficients in h j of, uh, oh, sorry, and r j lower uh, F lower star of F, and this converges to H I plus J of X with coefficients in F. So this says that if we have a, a scheme which maps to another scheme, we can compute its cohomology in terms of the cohomology of certain sheaves on the target scheme. Okay. Um, are there any questions about the statement of this? We'll see lots of examples throughout the course. All right, so, so the proof is, well, there's a, a general statement. So, so I'll, I'll just write a spectral sequence of a, of a composition, but I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it, of a composition of functors. So, so this is in Tohoku. So, so the general statement is that if you have two functors between abelian categories, so that the first one sends injectives to injectives, there's a spectral sequence computing the derived functors of the composition in terms of the composition of the derived functors. Um, so so um, I think I have enough time to say a little bit about like how to actually get your hands on this. So, so how do you compute this? So, so let's be explicit. So, so let's, let's compute um, our F lower star of f. So how do we do this? Can anyone tell me how do you compute the, the right derived functors of a given functor? Let's, let me say ri f lower star of f. Do you mean an injective resolution first? Yeah, so you take an injective resolution and then you take the, now the cohomology of f lower star of some injective resolution where here 
I F to I is an injective resolution. Okay, so now, now F lower star of I is a, this is a complex of injectives. So what we what we're trying to compute now, so we want to compute g lower star of f lower star of i, right? We, or we want really h i plus j of g lower star of f lower star of i. So so this is something uh, here. I'm just using that. I'm I'm saying this literally is um, is our i plus j of um, G composed with F or star of F. Great. So, so the, the content here is that I don't have to replace this F lower star I with another injective resolution. Okay, and now, now in order to do that, you take the, now take the spectral sequence of the filtered complex. Uh, where the co underlying complex is F lower star of I bullet and the filtration is given by the, the truncations, sorry. So, so do you, do you have, have you seen this notation where you take the truncation of a complex? So this is something, this is a complex whose cohomology is the same in, as, as the original one in degree up to P and zero uh, above P. And all you do is you take the first P minus one terms of your complex, then, then you replace the pth term with the kernel of the differential and, and replace it with zero everywhere else. Okay, so this is a filtered complex. And whenever you have a filtered complex, you take, get a spectral sequence and you should check that the spectral sequence has the right terms. Great. Um, so, so, so let me just kind of uh, maybe be explicit about one of the differentials. So, so here's an example of a differential. Well, well, you can take tau less than or equal to p of f bullet i. This maps to tau less than or equal to p plus one of f bullet of f, f star i bullet. And this maps to, to H, um, I guess, P plus one, I think, of F I bullet in some degree. Okay, so now if you apply um, the, the drive functors of, of G lower star to this, you get a long exact sequence, which, which has some maps. And then at some point you get a R Q of uh, G lower star applied to this eight. What is this? This is um, R P plus one of F lower star of some sheaf F. So, so you get a map like this. So you get a map R P plus one F lower star. Sorry, I've screwed up the indices a little bit. And then via some differential to uh, R Q plus one G lower star of tau less than or equal to p of f lower star of i. Okay, and this this here, this will give you um, once you do a little bit of splicing. This is the going to be the differential, the first differential on the E two page of the spectral sequence. So at least in principle, like if you actually could write down in a, in, an acyclic resolution or a, or a uh, injective resolution, these things would be reasonably concrete. You, you really can write down the differentials. And re in real life, you kind of can't. Um, all right, I, I'm out of time now. Um, so, so let me stop recording, but I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone has a question. And next time we'll talk about the Brower group. <laughs>